Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, landscape design and architect students are the future for pollinators. And I know that that's a big responsibility that you've probably never even thought of before. But um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just go into it and I'll explain why I say that a little bit later. So my name is Terry Oxford. I've been an urban rooftop beekeeper in the city of San Francisco since 2008. Uh, it's funny the things that you're good at. <laughs> it's just weird. I never would have thought that I would be good at beekeeping, but I am. I'm an all-natural biodynamic beekeeper. And what that means is there are different schools of thought about raising bees. I believe in the traditional small craft uh, methods of keeping bees, which means I don't put uh, chemicals inside of their hives um, to um, treat them for uh, insects like there's there's all sorts of things going inside going on inside of a hive it's an entire ecosystem i believe in preserving the health of the that ecosystem so that's biodynamic and that's how um, i practice beekeeping um, but more important than anything to uh, bees is flowers it's it's impossible to think about bees and not think about flowers. And that's where um, landscape design comes in. More, most people don't think about what they're planting uh, in uh, cities and in suburbs or for homes. They don't think about it in terms of, being, of what they're planting being food for nature. And what I want to express and want people to really understand is that in these times that we're living, when pollinators are in serious trouble, you have to start thinking about what you plant that is something for an animal, an animal that we need to consume. So I'm going to be going more into that also a little bit later. But unfortunately for the folks at home, you can't taste these honeys. I've got samples along here if you want to pass them out. There, each, each plate has one specific sample. These are all Good Food Award winning honeys. Um, so the Good Food Awards is a national contest and I've entered my, uh, my honeys three times and won three times. And the reason being is because San Francisco currently enjoys an amazing diversity of plants and flowers uh, and trees as well. So that's the status of San Francisco right now, and it's glorious. The bees here enjoy year-round flowers. They can, pollen, they can collect pollen and nectar all year long, and that's unusual. That's unusual. It's because of our wonderful climate here in San Francisco. But what happens is the bees have a really balanced diet, and I know it's unusual to think about bees in terms of their nutritional needs, but just imagine it's like, if, if your child is just eating one thing, like, what, like eucalyptus trees only, or almond uh, flowers only, they would only, that's a monoculture diet. They wouldn't thrive. They would get sick. And so what's great about San Francisco, and the reason that the honeys keep winning, is because we have diversity of plant material here. And uh, so the bees are getting a balanced diet, and that's also why they're healthy in San Francisco. Um, so again, you know, my interest of, is in honey a little bit. The larger interest and in what I want to talk with you about is the importance of flowers. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about problems right now that there are no answers to yet. But your, as you grow into your jobs and into your careers, are going to be encountering answers. And it's going to happen. It has to happen. Right now, pollinators are in trouble because almost all plant material that is, uh, that is purchased and grown in, uh, in monoculture situations, are, uh, they use heavy chemicals in all of these, these plants. So when you buy a tree, for instance, and you're going to grow it, it's a flowering tree for, uh, just for its beauty, not necessarily for humans, like no nuts or fruits, these trees are treated, pre-treated at the nursery with what is called a systemic. So there's different types of systemics. There's, uh, there's neonicotinoid insecticides, and then there's fungicides, and I know you've probably heard of those. So what the studies are now finding is that these 
chemicals are the ones that are um, damaging pollinators. And the reason being is because the systemic makes the systemic function of the chemical makes the, pe the pesticide come out in the nectar and the pollen. So nectar is carbohydrate for bees and pollen is protein. So um, what happens is when a flowering tree like this has been treated with a systemic chemical, the flowers become poisonous to anything that comes along for a little sip of nectar or a little bite of pollen. And that includes birds as well. That's the studies are now showing that birds are also impacted by these. And by the way, these uh, products are being banned all around the world. Not here yet, but they will be. It's going to happen very soon. So again, what's great about you guys is that you're going to start thinking about this now when you're starting your careers and sourcing good nurseries that you'll be working with in the future. You can start looking for organic or systemic free uh, nurseries that are not treating their products with, um, with these chemicals. So just imagine this canopy. This is a meadow in the sky. It's basically a flowering tower of, um, of s nutrition for pollinators. And as you really close in and look at a tree like this, you'll see that there are literally millions of opportunities here for food. So each one of these clusters is, is a smaller cluster of flowers. And they, in turn, attract all sorts of pollinators. And I talk about bees, but really it's birds, it's butterflies, it's all of the creatures, the important creatures, that need to be here in order for us to survive. It's true. And I know you know that. I know that you know the importance of pollinators. So um, a good way to look at this is that when bees are looking for nutrition, they're unaware of what's in it. They're just coming and, and doing their job, doing what uh, they do best, pollinating. And when they go in and they take a piece of pollen, they'll take that back to the hive and put it into their cells inside of the hive. And then the chemicals get stronger over time. I'm sorry, they get stronger with the introduction of other chemicals. So it becomes like sort of a, a chemical soup inside of the hive. And um, they don't survive it. They cannot survive it. So um, that's why it's so important for the future landscapers to really understand that what you're doing now is to, is to ch it will change the future because whatever you plant in the city is going to be food for, uh, for nature. And uh, I know that everybody here understands the importance of having nature in the city. Because if you don't, you don't have birds and you just, it makes everybody a little bit less healthy. Um, and the reason that this is so important is because the pollinator life system, life system which is again, beneficial insects and uh, birds are one of the most important life systems of the planet, almost as important as our air and our water. And without those, it, food is gonna be different, nutrition is going to be different, your children are gonna have a different experience than you, than you do. So, um, to me, they're the most important creatures on the planet. I know that that's, uh, I know that that's unusual and they don't have to be yours. Um, so landscaping is, we're in interesting times right now with landscaping. People are becoming a little bit more open to thinking outside of the box and creating gardens that are not necessarily the old style of gardens. They're creating things that are a little bit more wild and not as, as um, you know, monoculture, and a little bit more wilding is exactly the recipe that is needed. So more native plants, more um, organic plants of any kind um, will attract the kind of, uh, of species that, that we want to attract. The situation that's, that we're in right now with pollinators, and I just have to tell you this, it's, di it's dire. We are experiencing 
something that, hang on. So what's happening right now, I know you know it's in the news that pollinators are not making it, they're not surviving. You guys are living in an interesting time. You really are, and I know that you're fully aware of that. Um, and there's nothing like the present to make changes that are going to affect the future. What people don't realize is that trees are one of the most important things that you can plant. And the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. Trees are a great source of nutrition for all sorts of animals. They're seeds. This is a palm tree, a jubea palm, 20 feet up. And you would never, ever imagine that there's this amazing amount of flowers and uh, food sources in a, in a palm tree. But all, almost all palm trees have this kind of um, display, uh, and typically right after a rain, too. This is a linden tree, same thing. It's amazing the amount of um, opportunities for nutrition in a linden. Those are, there's millions of flowers just in one single, one single tree. So again, feeding nature, trees are the most efficient and economic method of doing that. And again, the most important thing is to make sure that they're not treated with systemic insecticides or fungicides. So the way that the products work is the nursery grower will do an, a treatment of the tree. The systemic poison goes inside of the tree and it comes out in all of the, uh, in every way that it possibly can. Comes out in the nectar, comes out in the pollen, and then it also comes out on the tips of leaves is tiny drops of moisture. And those are, are um, water sources for a lot of animals. And that is called gotation. Like tiny drops of moisture come out of the tips of leaves. And when the tree's been treated with um, these chemicals, that is the strongest source right there of, um, of poison. Again, organic is best if you can find it. And creating organic um, uh, sources as a, as a uh, landscape uh, architect or designer you're going to want to have these kind of tools in your in your um, in your kit bag. You know, make sure that you know who is growing organic, who cares about it, who's talking about it, and uh, um, and utilize those sources and, and grow those sources. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so if you uh, get a non-organic tree, how long does it take for the systemic capacity? To system? That's a great question. Can They're you, showing. Can you repeat it? Yes, so the question asked is, how long do the systemics last in the trees? And the answers are based on very limited studies. Right now, they're showing about six years is the latest study. So that means bloom after bloom after bloom after bloom after bloom. So for six years, that tree is poisonous. It reduces, but there's been very little study on that. I think the University of... Um, or Penn State, I think, is doing uh, studies right now on, on how long they last. And they're finding that when trees don't lose their leaves annually, that the systemic stay longer. If they lose their leaves annually, it's almost like a cleansing that happens. Um, but again, studies are very limited on that. There's not been enough studies <laughs> on the longevity in trees. Xerxes Society is looking into it right now. Uh, the other thing that happens with systemics and with neonicotinoids is the, um, the nursery growers are not, it's curious how they're util utilizing the, these uh, chemicals because Friends of the Earth did a study and found the, re the amounts to range from 25 parts per billion all the way up to 860 parts per billion in young saplings. So it's almost impossible to say what happened there, like why a nursery person, you know, only treated one tree at a lower amount, 25 parts per billion, and then the other one was 860. So it's across the board, and there's been other studies that I just heard about this week of showing trees at 1,600 parts per billion. So those numbers are significant only if you understand uh, that the manufacturers of the poisons say that bees can tolerate 20 parts per billion, only 20. 
So, but the trees are showing uh, anywhere from 25 to 1600. So that's the problem. And then if you get a 1600, a tree that's ex exhibiting 1600 parts per billion in the pollen and the nectar and the gutation, the gutation, then how long does it take for that tree to become safe? I would say years or never, you know, quite possibly. Well, that's the other science. That's what other, um, uh, you know, uh, investigative. So the question is, are the studies biased if they're funded by the chemical that makes the poison? I say no. I say uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yes, it has to be biased. And then there's been a really, really good article um, um, by a journalist in the New York Times uh, about about how science has been tainted because the studies are only funded by the industry that makes the poison. And uh, so that's coming out right now. Danny Hakim wrote a great article in New York Times about exactly that and how scientists are kind of, either way, they're, they're, they, they can't win because they need the money to do the funding. And unfortunately, bees don't have any money to give. Otherwise, they would be getting different results because typically these studies show that it's okay for bees or what they do is they call for more studies. Or what they do is they create, they say, we're confused. We don't know. We need more studies. And to me, we don't have time for any more studies. Of course it's poison. Of course it's pesticides. Pesticides don't discriminate. You know, they don't discriminate between uh, beneficial insects and invasive insects. They just don't. They kill everything really, really well. Here's the other thing. That's really, um, to me, the main reason that pollinators are not making it is because uh, neonicotinoids, uh, you've all heard of DDT, it took a long time for DDT to get banned and a lot of industry pushed back for years and years and years. Neonicotinoids are between 7,000 and 14,000 times stronger than DDT. So that's scary. That's, that's, to me, that's, uh, that's, that's everything right there. The reason that these are on the market in the first place is because the industry does control so much of our agriculture. And if it's controlling agriculture for uh, tree nurseries and plant nurseries, it's absolutely controlling our food too. And if bees are eating this stuff, so are we. And you have to know that. There's been no studies of that and I find that telling as well you know what gets studied is uh, as important as, as what is not getting studied I think what's not getting studied is really good information about what they're not looking at like there's they just started testing honey for Roundup just in 2015 was the very first time that they tested honey for Roundup in the United States and the fact that they didn't test it before that is really telling information and of course every sample was positive everything had roundup in it to huge degrees difference the good thing about San Francisco pollinators is um, I mean it's great news for San Francisco pollinators it's not great news for pollinators outside of the city and in the middle of the country is that right now our treescape and our landscape is pretty clean it's pretty clean it's not perfectly clean, but we've been really fortunate to have a neglected tree canopy, <laughs> you know, that people didn't spray. And, um, and so that's made San Francisco pollinators a little bit healthier than around the country. You know, I talk to beekeepers from all around the world, and all beekeepers are suffering right now. Their bees are dying. And I'm not really, I'm not really acquaintances with beekeepers that are commercial beekeepers that are doing it as a business. I'm more associated with beekeepers that are doing it for the love of the, of the species and the hope that these animals will be there in the future, you know, when you guys have kids. So um, everybody's saying the same thing though right now. All around the world, it's bad. And these products are everywhere. They're the biggest sellers of these um, chemical companies, the absolute biggest sellers. So again, so that describes a problem that is not really yet being talked about because it's so 
depressing. I get it, you know, I'm no fun at parties. But I think that if, if you look at it, <laughs> you look at it a different way, like there's no answers right now. The, the uh, neonicotinoids and fungicides are in all of our, our uh, landscaping except natives and organic and they're hard to find but if you in your future and as you're in your travels wherever you go to after you graduate if you start thinking about this and making it important it's really likely to become a consumer driven effort if you basically if you build it they will come if you start saying to to growers you know i want something that's not treated with these chemicals that last for years you know, can you use something else? And because there are lesser ones, less dangerous uh, products than neonicotinoids, there are. Um, but again, you have to get away from the monoculture aesthetic of landscaping. That aesthetic, and I know you've all seen it, um, is creates, where it creates an industry, a landscape and nursery industry, where they grow one thing for miles and miles and miles. And that's what you want to get away from. You want to get away from that kind of industry that only grows monoculture. The future is not going to be monoculture simply because it's not sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, what that translates to is it doesn't work. There's the end of it. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't build into any sort of uh, future. Um, so sustainable uh, landscape is going to be more biodynamic. It's going to be organic. It's going to use um, beneficial plants that attract other, uh, that attract uh, insects that will help destroy that insect. So it's using nature, using nature to build instead of, instead of destroying nature to deplete, because that's our current agricultural structure. It's depleting all the time. It never really grows. That's old thinking. That's just old, old timer stuff. It needs to go away. And, you know, we need to look at things like and have a new uh, way of thinking outside of the box with your landscape design, you know, and incorporating more natural uh, designs into it. And that's, again, it's not for me, it's for bees. Um, so. There's a really, really good book called uh, Silent Spring, and it's written by a woman named Rachel Carson. And she wrote it in the 60s and started, she started a movement back then, basically the ecological movement. What she predicted 60 years ago is absolutely happening right now, and that was industrial agriculture is going to need stronger and stronger chemicals to keep growing the same thing because the pests become resistant and that's exactly what she what she predicted is what we are living right now so it's just so important to understand that what you can do right now again i'm sorry to keep repeating it but it's it's on you guys it's on you guys to create the need for a different product than what we have right now and i have nothing but faith in in young people i think that you guys are way smarter, and you've been handed a really difficult um, deal right now. So I think that the opportunities are really there for those who are willing to think outside of the box and make a difference. It's going to be in nature. It's going to be in planting. So um, I hope that you tasted that honey. The difference in the, in the color and in the flavor is based on what the bees are eating. So the dark honeys, the more complex honeys, those are gonna be from eucalyptus tree flowers. Uh, there's a lot of that in the San Francisco area, and that's a really nutritious uh, plant or tree for pollinators. It's got a lot of good enzymes and vitamins in it. And then the light ones are more palm tree flowers, like the pink one that you saw. Um, that is a delightful, um, source of food for bees. It's light, it's kind of citrusy, and it's got a, just a, a pop of, I can't describe it as anything else but light, almost like a sunlight. It's really a beautiful, um, beautiful honey. And then uh, most of the other ones have a mixture of, of rose, citrus, 
lavender for sure, uh, rosemary. And then in San Francisco, the honeys always finish with a, a, a licorice taste. And, and it's the fennel that grows wild in the city. The bees just love it. And they, they have fennel almost, it blooms for a, a, at least half of the year. So, and then it gives everything a sort of an anise flavor, which is really pretty. It's really lovely. So, yeah. Did you have any other questions? You were asking really good questions. <laughs> yeah, if you have a question, this is the place to do it. Does anyone? Does anyone? We had a few questions uh, online, I think. OK. Hi, thank you to everyone who's watching online currently. Um, this is Catherine speaking. I'm the administrator here at the School of Landscape Architecture. Uh, we have a number of, of people joining us. One specifically is um, in Vallejo, and she had a question right off the bat. Um, I know you were mentioning, um, you know, buying organic plants. Uh, her question is specifically, where can people and landscape architects find untreated or organic plants and flowers? So again, this is, this is the problem I don't have an answer to, and the solution is going to come from, uh, from consumers demanding this kind of thing. Currently, uh, there are no major tree nurseries in the state of California that are not using these poisons. Uh, they've been using them system systematically for a good 15 years, and so uh, to me, that's, that's the reason pollinators are way, way down. You can go to native plant nurseries and get plants, but again, those are often smaller, um, but they're at least clean and they're nutritious. They feed local pollinators and are great for um, uh, drought, uh, drought tolerance and things like that. So native plant nurseries are a great source to start looking at, and then Talk to tree nurseries. I've been talking about this for about three years, and there are two tree nurseries that have just started planting two years ago, uh, systemic-free um, trees for cities. And uh, one is in Santa Rosa, and the other one's in South San Francisco. I'm not sure about that one, how they're doing. But it's just, it's a process. If it becomes important, people will do it. And this message is getting out there, and when people realize the importance of trees, they're going to start demanding um, neonic free trees. Yeah, and I would say um, when I was uh, practicing, this became an issue, and I had a lot of clients who wanted um, the chemical free plants, and the only nursery I could find in the Bay Area was Devil Mountain, which mm -hmm. is out in the East Bay, and they are marketing themselves as being a chemical free, <laughs> sorry, I'll come over here with you, uh, nursery for to be able to um, sell for larger projects, but it's not large commercial projects. And it's true that um, finding trees is, is, is hard. Yeah. What I found is I think this issue is like any uh, issue that you want to change is if you follow the money. And if landscape architects tell the nurseries, I'm not going to buy trees from you until you provide uh, these, I mean, you have to get, you know, when you're on a project, you've got to get plants and they, they have to get in the ground. So it's a tricky thing. It's, it's easier to just kind of go with the flow. But I think, like everything, if you, if you demand it, say, we want this, then the, a market will form for it. And it will form faster yeah. the more people did do it. Yeah. So Agreed. Devil Mountain did it because yeah. Yeah. They, had, they had landscape architects saying, we want, we want this. Will you do this? And so they started creating blocks of growing areas where they would do it. I've been talking with the city of San Francisco about the trees that they're bringing in. Uh, they're bringing in about 55,000 uh, trees um, over the next several years. And I called all the vendors, and almost 75% of them are using systemics and neonics. And so I talked to the city, and um, you know, I just put it in writing. I was like, you guys can't do this. You can't do this. And they are entertaining other ideas, like maybe starting a tree nursery, but um, I don't believe anything has happened as a result. So I've started thinking, you know, I don't really look to politicians to solve my problems. Um, I think that <laughs> 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 um, 
And I think that I think that people will solve the problems. And then, because you have to create a groundswell underneath a politician to move him or her. You have to create a movement and a need, and then they follow, they respond, but they won't, they won't fix things, they cannot. Um, so that's why I'm talking with, uh, I, I, I'm always thinking about the most efficient way to make my, my animals survive and, and thrive, and to me, it's the people that are planting. So I'm talking with different corporations, property management corporations downtown, and working only with uh, companies that do care and that will plant something on their rooftop. And so that's what's happening. I don't work with any hotels. You'd mentioned hotels, and I've said no to all the hotels. Um, but I work with several. I work with a company, property management company called Heinz Property Management. They're international. They've got seven buildings in San Francisco, and three of them are all organic. In fact, soil and everything, and they're making compost tea in the basement at 101 California, which is like, that's everything. I mean, they had me at compost tea. I'm such a geek. Um, but yeah, so that means that they know that the importance is from soil to seed to sapling. It has to be chemical free because these poisons, if they're in the soil too, they still leach up into the plant and come out. It's hard to know how much, but I believe you know, any, there's, there's no safe dose of this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We have a, a number of other questions here online. You were talking about the different um, just companies in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, Annie May had a question. What's your favorite beekeeping supply company in the area? And it sounds like they're even interested in getting involved. So maybe you could recommend some classes and things like that. They've specifically asked about classes. Yeah, I get asked about beekeeping all the time. And um, I think that it's, it's, um, it's not for everybody. And if you want to be a beekeeper, the best thing to do is to make sure that you have enough clean nutrition for your animals. Um, many beekeepers, uh, their bees die pretty quickly. And there's all sorts of reasons. Um, there's like, there's diseases, there's mites, there's of starvation, a lot of starvation. Um, so to me, it's like having a child and not making sure that I have all enough, all my resources lined up. So if you're going to be a beekeeper, I think it's really important that you think about the quality of food that they're going to be eating. So um, I belong to an organization that sort of was loosely tracking the amount of uh, chemical-free food and found that there's really no area in the whole middle of the country where it's safe for pollinators, safe for bees. Like almost the entire central part of the United States is so over, um, is so over, uh, you, they've used industrial agricultural chemicals almost to, you know, to the, to the dearth of bees, to the peril of bees. So the thing about being a beekeeper is it's just really important to make sure that they've got good nutrition. I'm really lucky, and I know I am, in San Francisco, because I know what the tree, I know what the city uses, I know all the chemicals that are allowed in the city, I know the trees, I know the, um, the planting, I know um, what they're gonna be putting into the city, so I know where not to put my bees. Um, but the most important bees are native bees. Bumbles, masons, carpenters, all of these other bees and the other pollinators are really important and when you are planting for pollinators, you're planting for everything, not just honeybees. Honeybees are the least important bees. They really are. Um, so if you're going to think about being a beekeeper, absolutely find a mentor. Try not to buy commercial packages of bees because they're often brought in from somewhere that's not local. And what they do is they, you know, they're spreading stuff around. Um, it's good to have a friend. Uh, I studied, uh, I studied uh, ancient myth in school, and I remember reading one of the ancients who said, you should never buy or sell bees. Not honey, you can buy or sell honey, but you should never buy or sell bees. That, and the, the, the understanding that I took from that was some things are not, some things are not, um, you can't monetize everything. That some things are just sacred for themselves. And the pollination life system of the planet is one of those things 
that, in my opinion, we're suffering from the monetization of bees. It's an industry, like billions of dollars. Of, uh, and whenever you have a, a massive industry like that, you're going to have all sorts of conflicts of interest. So the best thing to do is to have a friend mentor you as a beekeeper, because it's really easy to kill bees. And then, um, and then the second thing to do is to try and get local bees from someone that you know. And you know the provenance of the queen and where she's from and who's, who she's bred with. I mean, you want local bees for your local climate. And that's, that's not easy. That takes more research than most people are willing to get. And you'll always find somebody that's willing to sell you bees. You know, people sell bees on Craigslist. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's a business. The bee business. Don't get me going. <laughs> This is related to that. You, you're talking about native versus non-native. How is that affecting your specific work? Then the, the question was, can you speak to the importance of native versus non-native bees and native versus non-native bees, sorry, native versus non-native plants in your work? Yes. So um, very, very important question. And I personally believe that honeybees are far less important than native bees. Native bees, wherever you are, are the major pollinators. And they are eating the same food and suffering the same fate as honeybees. Honeybees are interesting uh, because they're the, really, they're the only insects that we measure and, um, and know what they're doing because we're financially tied to them. We're economically tied to the honeybee because of the pollination system in this country and how the pollination pollinators, I'm sorry, how the beekeepers truck their bees around the country. So we know what's going on with honeybees, but the other bees are the important bees and they're not being measured to the same degree at all because we're not tied to them economically and we're, we're kind of, you know, we're a selfish species. So we don't really think about other species until they're gone, until they're extinct. But butterflies are critically important for um, pollination, as are you know bumbles. And San Francisco has a vast amount of biodiversity. Just in, there's we're in a in a really unique situation right here. We've got a ton of biodiversity. There's almost no other place on the planet like us. I think somewhere in Japan, but otherwise it's just us. We've got a ton of biodiversity, and you can still go to the store and you know and not even be able to read the labels because it's so microscopic and buy hazardous chemicals that you can spray in your garden and these same chemicals require a hazmat suit and that shouldn't be that should not be and that's the way it is you can buy any of this stuff at home depot and you shouldn't be able to because people you know they think if a little is good a lot is better and that's how when they spray you know, they're going, oh, I'm going to really kill that bug, and they're spraying, and they're, you know, and then, and then that goes into the system of the whole tree, and then your tree is poisonous. So people don't even realize what they're doing and what they're buying. And the chemical industry knows this. They know that people will overuse, and they're okay with that. They're okay with making money. So, yeah. Did I answer that question? <laughs> What about African, African bees? bees? are here. They're coming. And they're probably going to be the survivor bees. And this ties into your natives question. Native plants, I've got a, I've got a whole love-hate thing with the native plant um, voice that you hear. I totally believe in native plants. I know that they're the most nutritious and they are the most inviting to the wildlife that should be there. Um, we're not living in the 1860s anymore. We are living in, in this time when climate change is here and it's happening. We're getting warmer. Trees and plants can't move, but animals do. They move. They're getting, they're getting I was in Norway a couple years ago and they said they've never seen so many fish. And it's because everything is moving north because the water is cooler and you know the climate is better for them. So that's the same with everything else. Everything else is moving north. Uh, and trees, plants can't. But the ones that are surviving, I think that the native plant people, oh, I don't know if I want to get into this. Um, I'm going to withdraw from that because it's such a hot subject. It's not mine. 
but I think that there needs to be a little, I'm just going to say a little bit more um, uh, thought process with the native plant people and their willingness to destroy plants that are and trees that are doing well in a, in a current location and their willingness to use chemicals to kill them. So that's the problem I have with native plant people that are willing to use Roundup to destroy landscape because that stuff doesn't go away. Also a systemic. And uh, what the other thing I didn't mention about systemic, sorry, this is really important, is that they leach into the soil and they are in our water. They've been found in every water source that they've, that's been tested, these, these chemicals. And they don't go away, they're persistent for years. So that's the other thing, is native plant people, so Africanized bees, sorry, are the new non-native um, that is going to hybridize, they're going to, they're already starting, so they're, they're mating with uh, the European honeybee, which is what I have, and they're becoming a little bit more, uh, so the European honeybee is very, it's docile, and that's its personality type. Um, the Africanized honeybees, they say, are more, uh, they get angry quicker, and uh, that has not been my personal experience. I went down to LA recently and helped somebody with uh, an Africanized beehive that was under some wood, and I was underneath the hive uh, looking up at it, and we were cutting the comb, basically ripping this hive apart that had been there for a couple of years. It was big, and they were the most beautiful bees. They were dark chocolates, reds, blacks, browns. They were absolutely gorgeous, and they were a fine machine. They were just amazing looking bees, and they looked different. But what they they were was um, they were lovely, and we again ripped their house apart. Like they had every opportunity to go crazy on us and didn't. So I think that there's a lot of hype and a lot of fear. And whenever you have hype and fear, you've got to assume that you're getting a different. There's opportunity there for another message that's probably not the truth. Um, they're going to hybridize. They're going to make the European honeybee probably a little bit more hot and then, uh, but mellow out, and that's already been the reports that people are saying about them. But I don't know, I don't have them, and um, I've never had an incident with them. So, um, you know, I can't really speak to that with experi from experience, and I don't think I would work with bees if I thought they were gonna be dangerous to people. Um, I just don't think I would do it. But other people are saying that they're absolutely fine. And they're people I trust, people in Los Angeles that I know, and um, they're saying it's hype. And I, I tend to believe that, you know, the press loves, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, if they, they love a good story. So, yeah. Right. Well, especially if you have one where there's somebody running down the road and has to dive into a lake to escape a swarm of bees. Yeah. Well, and but then some that's what's in your mind yeah. forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think that um, they're going to be here and they're going to, uh, they're strong, they're a strong animal and they're probably um, going to do better than the European honeybee. Uh, it's not doing very well. It's really not. Uh, the way that we treat it and the way that we handle it and manage it, it's all about birth control um, and it's not natural in any way. And I think that it's hard for um, beekeepers like me to see an industry that um, doesn't, doesn't respect the life um, as much as I think it should. And that's my personal opinion. So. Great, thank you. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you.